WCOP presents the 8 o'clock movie. Featuring the finest motion pictures on LA's number one movie station. For the first time on television, a special presentation of the original episode that launched a legend, Star Trek's The Cage. Patrick Stewart hosts a two-hour spectacular, interviews with Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, the original Star Trek cast, including William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and the stars of Star Trek The Next Generation. See how the legend began and lives on. Our presentation will begin in just a moment. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Her ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life forms and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Everybody remember where we part. We come in peace. Battle stations. Something got me! Six seconds to impact. Star Trek Saga, from one generation to the next. Hosted by Patrick Stewart, with interviews and appearances by members of the original casts of Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation. And the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry. Hello, I'm Patrick Stewart. All around me is evidence of man's phenomenal achievements in space from the first landing on the moon to the space shuttle missions and beyond. In the next two hours, we'll explore another incredible phenomenon in the world of television and motion pictures, one that has lasted for over 20 years and is still going strong today, the Star Trek saga. We'll take you behind the scenes for an in-depth look at the history of this acclaimed series, from its early beginnings to the new series, Star Trek The Next Generation. And for the first time on television, we'll present a rare color version of Gene Roddenberry's original Star Trek pilot, The Cage, recently discovered in the archives of Paramount Studios' vaults. Our historic journey through the Star Trek saga from one generation to the next will begin in a moment. In 1976 marked the era of the Space Shuttle, an exciting new development in NASA's space program. Although seven years had passed since the cancellation of the original Star Trek series, its popularity endured. Over 400,000 letters were sent to Washington demanding that NASA name the first of these experimental space shuttles after the futuristic starship in the popular television series. The Enterprise Space Shuttle illustrates just part of the enormous impact Star Trek has had on our culture. The original series has become the most successful syndicated show in television history. In addition, there have been four hit movies and a new series, Star Trek The Next Generation. Why has Star Trek been popular for so long? Well, there are several theories. Many believe it presents a message of hope for the future of mankind. Others admire its futuristic depiction of current social issues. Some simply enjoy seeing one good adventure after another. It speaks to some basic human needs that uh, uh, there is a tomorrow. It's not all going to be over with a big flash and a bomb. I never could figure out what it was. And we have spent four movies trying to figure out what made the original series work so well. And if you think of them as futuristic folk tales or futuristic legends, there's something that can be told time and time again, and you come back to them because, in part, they are familiar. The only uh, reason I can give is that, hey, it's got some kind of magic to it. But the future of Star Trek was not always so bright. Let's warp speed back in time to see how this extraordinary series came into existence. Back in 1964, 
Gene Roddenberry proposed a series that would explore ideas within a space travel format. He promised to deliver a kind of wagon train to the stars. Well, so there was sort of a, a little fakery on my part, too, because Westerns were exciting then, and, and they could understand wagon train, whereas they, very few people in those days read science fiction, and almost no network executives or studio heads. Roddenberry wrote and produced a pilot episode entitled The Cage, which you will see tonight. It starred Jeffrey Hunter, Susan Oliver, and the young Leonard Nimoy. However, the executives at NBC rejected Gene's concept, calling the Cage pilot too cerebral. I felt that I'd double-crossed him. I'd read him this, written him this thing about uh, where the mind went in, in certain ways. And they wanted someone with bare knuckles and a fist fight. But something unique happened. For the first time in history, a second pilot was commissioned. This time, NBC was pleased with the result, and the Enterprise's five-year mission finally took flight in 1966. Several cast changes were made, and the only survivor of the cage pilot was Leonard Nimoy's character of Spock. I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. Captain Kirk is Captain Hornblower of the, the sailing ships, who was a great hero, and Hemingway said it's the uh, most exciting uh, uh, adventure fiction in the human language. Hailing frequencies open, sir. I was pleased that uh, in those days, when uh, you couldn't get even blacks on television, that I not only had a black, but a black woman and a black officer. We need some repair, sir, but the ship is intact. Scots have always been shipbuilders and ship engineers and so on. Planet dead ahead, Captain. It seems to indicate artificial power being generated in factor seven quantities. Great affection I have for Asians and what they do and the important part they play in the world. How close will we come to the nearest Klingon outpost if we continue on our present course? Ah, one part six, sir. Close enough to smell them. <laughs> Chekhov came on the show because I'd read something and uh, someone had sent me a copy of a Russian newspaper in which they said after our first year, oh, the ugly Americans are at it again. We were the first people in space, and then, but the Americans don't even have a Russian aboard this crew. Within three months of that first season, Star Trek was in danger of an early cancellation. The ratings were shaky, and only a massive letter campaign by its viewers kept the show alive. To put things in historical perspective, Let's remind you of the 60s when Star Trek originally aired. The space program was preparing for its first lunar landing. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. rallied thousands in support of civil rights. A half a million people gathered in Woodstock for peace, love, and rock and roll. And students protested across America, calling for an end to the war in Vietnam. To temporarily escape some of the disturbing events in the world, the majority of television viewers tuned into a familiar western or a light-hearted sitcom. Among the most popular shows at the time were Bonanza, The Beverly Hillbillies, Rowan and Martin's Laughing, and Mission Impossible. But there was something very special about Star Trek. It was the only television show on the air that presented a future where all races and cultures worked together, where men and women explored the galaxy to better understand the universe and themselves. Came a time when our weapons grew faster than our wisdom and we almost destroyed ourselves. The impact that it had on people at a given time and point in history was so strong and so positive that the future was worth living. We were once a people like yourselves, wildly emotional often committed to irrationally opposing points of view. Only the discipline of logic saved my planet from extinction. The characters um, were di dimensional. The relationships were complex. Uh, the, there were twists. There were, the, the plots were, you know, well-constructed. Many acclaimed science fiction writers contributed stories to Star Trek. One of the most praised episodes was the award-winning City on the Edge of Forever. A story that hurls the crew back in time. One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies. 
energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in, in some sort of spaceship. And the men that reach out into space will be able to find ways to feed the hungry millions of the world and to cure their diseases. And those are the days worth living for. Recognize that face? That's Dynasty's Joan Collins, just one of the many famous guest stars that appeared during Star Trek's three-year run. Psychiatry, Captain. My assignment is to study crew reaction in emergency condition. However, despite the efforts to present a realistic and insightful vision of the future, Star Trek made its final voyage on June 3rd, 1969, cutting short its five-year mission. Ironically, just after its cancellation, Neil Armstrong became the first astronaut to set foot on the moon, traveling there in an Apollo space capsule identical to this one I'm sitting in, which made the same journey nearly two years later. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Not only did this historic event generate a growing interest in space, but there was also a growing interest in science fiction as well. As a result, Star Trek became an immediate success in syndication. The upsurge of the support from Star Trek fans became very, very evident. Uh, Philadelphia stations were getting ratings that were unheard of prior to 1971 when Star Trek came out. Uh, I always told everybody that this was a phenomenal success, and even though we were verging on being canceled every year we were there, I, I told them, dismiss this. This is a phenomenal success, and 20 years from now, we will be making movies. After it had rerun about five times, I told my wife, well, it's all over, you know, it's been nice. And I said the same thing when it ran 20 times. I'm only joking about the fact that I said it was phenomenal. I'd like to see a smile on your face. Nobody knew nothing. A new kind of fan began to appear. They were called Trekkies, or as they prefer to be known, Trekkers. They believed in the ideals of Star Trek and faithfully watched the series in reruns. A few years ago, one bride and groom were actually wed in a Star Trek style ceremony. We are gathered here together in the sight of God and in the presence of Starfleet and this gathering to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Far too many people believed, and many still believe, that they're a bunch of teenagers who wear odd clothing and, and give odd signs and things, but they're not. Uh, uh, Trekkers uh, include businessmen, uh, bank presidents, stockbrokers, uh, college professors, and, and a large number of astronauts. Before long, Star Trek memorabilia was popping up all across America. T-shirts, buttons, model spaceships, comic books, fan magazines, the list goes on for light years. And for many years, fans sent a continuing barrage of letters to the network, urging that Star Trek be brought back, but to no avail. Which brings us up to 1976, when the experimental space shuttle Enterprise, very similar to the one here on display, was launched. Coincidentally, Gene Roddenberry was hoping to launch a new Star Trek movie. The original crew had agreed to return, new scripts were written, and elaborate sets were constructed. And finally, in 1978, Star Trek, the motion picture, went before the cameras. Soon, Star Trek fans would have their wish fulfilled. In 1979, the Voyager 2 satellite was in the process of recording some dramatic photographs of Jupiter. About the same time, a fictitious Voyager 6 was causing trouble for the crew of the Enterprise in the first ever Star Trek feature film. Ten years after the show's cancellation, Gene Roddenberry and the original cast were reunited. It would begin a new era in this science fiction legend. The fans were wild for the idea. And I kind of liked the idea, too. I was broke. With uh, our old friends all together again, it was uh, a dizzying feeling. It was a glorious feeling. We, 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 that, I must say, is one of the days that I will always remember. You see an individual whom you hadn't seen anyway uh, for the first time. And it, 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 was, uh, it was strange. It was um, deja vu. 
I mean, we had been told in the course of the last three or four years that we were going to do Star Trek again, and each time it fell apart. It didn't materialize. So it's hard not to become jaundiced and, and cynical about this kind of situation. But there we were. We were really doing it. And I had this almost overwhelming desire to embrace everybody. The first day on the set, when we were all standing there in wardrobe, and Bob Wise, he happened to be standing in the pit, he looked at us and he said, I just really realized, and I didn't until this moment, when you're on the set, I'm standing in the midst of living legends. It was very expensive to make the first Star Trek motion picture, roughly $44 million. To put those numbers in perspective, that's equal to the cost of sending two Apollo space missions to the moon. But as expensive as it was to produce, the film has grossed over $175 million. Witnessed a birth, possibly a next step in our evolution. 1982 marked the premiere of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, inspired by a previous episode entitled Space Seek. Ricardo Montalban reprised his role as the evil nemesis, with Kirsty Alley featured as a Vulcan-Romulan hybrid. This time, the producers collaborated with the special effects wizards at George Lucas Industrial Light and Magic. I shall leave you as you left me, buried alive. Shut! By 1983, the Star Trek phenomenon was in high gear. So much so that the fans' anticipation of the next film prompted an incredible amount of security on the Paramount lot to prevent any leaks of its storyline. And while the crew was looking for their favorite Vulcan in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, Leonard Nimoy sneaked behind the camera and into the director's chair. You don't have to leave them to do it. The day that they come back to work together, if you were to gather with them in the makeup department and watch them all getting their makeups on and telling each other stories about what's been happening to them while since the last time they made a movie together, you'd find that it's like family coming together again and, and reporting to each other. So the chemistry is always there. Christopher Lloyd played an evil Klingon determined to destroy Captain Kirk and his crew. And as a result, this movie would mark the end of the Starship Enterprise. May she rest in peace. In 1986, another milestone was achieved, the 20th anniversary of the show's creation. Cutting the cake with Gene Roddenberry as Gene's wife, Major Barrett, who has appeared in many of the original series' most famous episodes, is Nurse Chapel. We all, we all banded together 20 years ago to, uh, to do something very positive about the future, and, and here we are in the future still doing it. It's a very logical idea, isn't it? Staying true to the original Star Trek philosophy, an important social issue was raised in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. This time, the crew is on a quest to save the whales and thus protect the future of mankind. Admiral, there'll be whales here! Leonard Nimoy assumed the director's chair again, and with a more of a tongue-in-cheek style, Star Trek IV reached the most receptive audience yet. Now, as promised, the moment has come to present the original Star Trek pilot, The Cage. This rare color print, which has never been seen on television, was recently discovered in the archives of the Paramount vaults. And when we return, you'll see this classic episode for the very first... Well, we hope you've enjoyed the original pilot episode of The Cage, which was filmed back in 1965. Now stay tuned for glimpses of Star Trek in the future, including a behind-the-scenes look at Star Trek The Next Generation and a preview of Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Now let's warp speed ahead to 1988. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier is going before the cameras. For the first time, William Shatner will handle the directing chores. I want to tell you how, how it goes. Okay, once upon a time, there was a little girl, a little boy walking. I can't tell you the Star Trek V plot. That's ridiculous. Well, we've all taken an oath. Okay. Uh, and I do intend to live long and prosper. If you want to see a big movie in June of the summer with strange and interesting things, come and see it. Earlier this year, Universal Studios and Paramount Pictures with Gene Roddenberry teamed up to present the Star Trek Adventure, a new attraction of the Universal Studios tour. And by overwhelming demand, this year also marked the era of a new science fiction series of which I am proud to be a part, Star Trek 
the next generation. Many of the original production crew were brought back under the guidance of executive producer Gene Roddenberry. On the original Star Trek, I, I practically lost my family from working so many 12-hour days, 14-hour days, seven days a week. And I said, uh, you can't pay me enough to, to do that. But then they said, hey, but suppose we did it in a way in which they, they call syndication, in which we don't have a network, and we don't have all those people. And Paramount was saying to me, and we guarantee to you that you will be in charge of the show. The thing that's amazed me about Roddenberry more than anything else is that he has never allowed anything to change his image of the future. Not studios, not networks, not writers like me coming in saying, come on, Gene, Don Johnson, Miami Vice, let's heat it up. None of that. He maintains that integrity to that vision. Now let's bring you up to date with this new series. Stardate, the 24th century. 78 years have passed since the days of Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. Much larger starship Enterprise explores the outer reaches of the universe, and as Captain Jean-Luc Picard, I lead an expert team of crew members to seek out new life and new civilizations. Let's see what's out there. I have no problem with following any rules you lay down, short of compromising your safety. Riker is going to be, and he's turning into the ideal, number one, who feels that this is his vessel. The captain just borrows it now and then to command. I, I see color variations and complex harmonies. Jordy is going to become engineer this year, and he, he, he is fine. He's, he's got a sense of humor. He has a flip personality. Uh, it's a nice contrast to the other people and a likable fellow. I am superior, sir, in many ways, but I would gladly give it up to be human. Data, of course, is Pinocchio. He would like his thing he wants most in life to be is, is a real flesh and blood boy. You're under tremendous pressure. More than you've ever experienced. You should be proud of the way you're handling command. Thanks, Counselor. Troy says to the audience, human engineering is just as important as cogs and, and grease and, and all of those things. We need human engineers to make people work together smoothly. But to have a society so intermixed with computers, it has tremendous advantages. Wesley was built a little bit on myself at 14. I was never the genius he is, but uh, that's a wonderful time of life. I'm a Klingon, sir. For me to seek escape when my captain goes into battle. You are a Starfleet officer, Lieutenant. Aye, sir. To have a Klingon, a savage character like this, and have him spend time in the Space Academy and learn civil behavior and so on, but still have this warrior strength, uh, makes him a very exciting character. Just as Gene Roddenberry was careful in casting the original series, much consideration went into choosing this new cast. I personally spent months talking with Gene and the producers before a decision was made. It was... Uh seven auditions over six weeks so it was harder than the job has been and certainly more nerve-wracking but it obviously has been a, quite a peach of a job the phone rang and it was them saying you got the job <laughs> so after i pe peeled myself off the ceiling i started to unpack it was literally if they'd called you know three hours later I'd have been at LAX on my way back to London. It's gratifying to me that this new cast has banded together so quickly. It's that ensemble feeling off screen that can heighten the sense of reality on screen. You know, we all sort of look out for each other and stick up for one another and, and uh, you know, we'll all go to bat for each other. And especially if you're going to go, which we think we are, for another five or six years. You know, that, that camaraderie and that, you know, that warmth is there. And this season, two new crew members will beam aboard the Enterprise. Diana Muldor will portray the ship's new chief medical officer, Dr. Catherine Pulaski. I left town and moved to the mountains, to the high Sierra Nevada, with my husband, and uh, thought that I'd left all this behind and got a call for this and couldn't turn it down. It was just too exciting, so here I am. And celebrated actress Whoopi Goldberg will appear in a recurring role as a special guest star. What she's going to play is uh, 
basically a bartender in a very uh, exciting new uh, set that we've built uh, in the very forward part of the ship called Ten Forward, which looks out on all of space. If you think about yourself on the bow of the, of the Queen Mary, uh, that's where we're going to be, right out there where it's all coming at you like this. We discussed having bartenders who maybe would be extremely sexy and others that would be uh, very alien. And in the midst of trying to figure out what we were going to do behind the bar at Ten Forward, we got this call from Whoopi Goldberg saying, come have lunch, uh, I want to join your team. And uh, it, it took only seconds to realize what the perfect spot for her would be. In keeping with the philosophy of the original series, Gene Roddenberry continues to explore the social issues of today amid the galaxy of the 24th century. Among them are such problems as war, drug addiction, and the arms race. Once unleashed, the unit is invincible. You poor fools, your own creation destroyed you. One episode from our first year, entitled The Big Goodbye, was honored with the George Foster Peabody Award, which recognizes outstanding achievements in television broadcasting. During that encounter, you may have noticed one of the ship's new technological advances, the holodeck, a 24th century extension of today's computer games. This device allows the crew to recreate any place they desire, real or imaginary from a tranquil corner of green countryside to a jazzy New Orleans nightclub. And by the way, that's no hologram. That's Jonathan Frakes actually playing the trombone. That's just one of the many differences between the original series and this new generation. For instance, the new Starship is eight times larger than its predecessor, travels at much faster speeds, and can separate from its saucer section in an emergency situation. I think that there was a, uh, a rapid skepticism throughout both the fans and the media and the critics and when they realized that we weren't trying to recreate Kirk and Spock and Bones. There's a, a part of our psychological makeup, I believe, that is really noble and is really interested in developing, growing and developing in, in, in the progression that Roddenberry has taken us. I've been asked the question, you've, you've, after doing all of those episodes, is, is there, are there new things you can do? My God, yes. Uh, the, the basis of our series is the galaxy, and there's quite a few stories out there. Man has barely scratched the surface of space exploration in the 20th century. Who knows what man will be exploring in the 24th? Perhaps Star Trek The Next Generation can give us an indication. And if the ideas it presents are accurate, the future looks promising. In any event, the Star Trek saga is sure to continue from one generation to the next as long as there's an audience that dreams of a future filled with hope and excitement. It'll go on with, uh, without any of us and get better and better and better because that's the, that really is the human condition, is to improve and improve. I'm Patrick Stewart. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you in the future. If not in this century, then perhaps the 24th. Live long and prosper. Good night. Coming this November, an all-new season of high adventure with Star Trek, the next generation. Captain Picard and the crew of the USS Enterprise, Riker, Jordy, Data, Wesley, Worf, and Troy. Ready to take on any challenge and to boldly go where none have gone before. This year, two new members join the crew in their ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds and examine new life and new civilizations. Diana Muldor is the ship's new medical doctor, and Whoopi Goldberg beams aboard as an alien humanoid in the new 10 Forward Lounge. Don't miss the all-new exciting episodes of Star Trek, The Next Generation. The legend lives on.
I'm Tim Malloy. The Quail Bush high stakes debate is over. Who won? Some key campaign managers will be here to have a debate of their own on our set tonight. The INS and the Catholic Church square off on the sanctuary issue. We'll tell you about that. And LSD and acid rock music are making a comeback. We'll tell you where. Coming up on the news. Tonight at 11, there's a killer on the hill, and the blues are his target. And Belker is an unlikely bag lady on the next Hill Street Blues. And now stay tuned for the latest news and information with Tim Malloy and Wendy Rutledge on News 13 next. Thank you.